Good morning, church. Let's stand to our feet. Let's welcome the Lord in this place. all belongs to you we're full of expectation we're gonna see you move where two or more are gathered there's power in the room you're all our hearts are after there's nothing you can do Welcome to Bethel Full Gospel, and 
Welcome online to Bethel Saratoga. It's good to worship together and to lift up the name of Jesus. He is worthy of praise in this place. And this morning, he is, he is already here. His presence is already here. So we just want to welcome him and lift up his name that he would be enthroned on our praises. So Father, we come before you this morning. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that in you there is always hope. And in you there is always victory, Father. So we come before you to worship you. In your name, amen. Above the battle, the undefeated Savior stands with me, the fighter for the weary, the Lamb of God, the Lion Heart.
Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Lift it up on Calvary's hill. We
see before, back in Bible times, they had to give a sacrifice. They had to get a spotless lamb. They had to give a goat without any blemishes. But see, Jesus came and he paved the way without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness for you and I. But Jesus, told, he chose to go to that cross because he loves you, because he loves me. And because of him, we can be victorious because he is our victorious king. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did, for the price you
things feel extra heavy things are going on in this world that we have no control over but the Bible says Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life if you can't find truth in what you're seeing look to him he is the truth he is the way he won't steer you wrong he is the way maker he makes all things come together He's a miracle working God. That's who He is. For you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are.
we pray for our brothers and our sisters on the other side of the world who who are are hiding away father but they're still lifting up your name god and i pray for strength through that god as we stand here and we're we're able to sing and worship freely father we pray that they would feel your peace and your strength as we worship alongside them, Father. As we are the body of Christ, God, and I pray that they would feel that, they would sense that, our prayers. God, you are always good, and you work all things together for your good. working God walks beside us every day, every step of the way. We thank you that you call us your own and we can worship you in spirit and in truth, Father. Be enthroned on our praises. We love you. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Bethel. We're so glad you can be with us. 
for our first time guests to get connected, please text Bethel Guest to 94000. And on the way out, please stop by the welcome desk to receive a free gift on us. Hey Bethel, it's that time of year again for our baby bottle drive to help Alpha Pregnancy Center. Remember, $10,000 is our goal this year to help support them. In the foyer are baby bottles that you can go and grab and collect your change, put some bills in there, write a check, or maybe some jewelry as Will said last week. But bring those back and help us support the ministry of Alpha Pregnancy Center. The starting point class for this month is the Connect class. And this class helps you to learn more about Bethelful Gospel Church, our mission, meet some of our staff, and really get to learn what we're all about. Our meet and greet dinner is coming up March 6th at 5.30 p.m. Whether you're new here at Bethel or you've been here for some time and you're looking to get connected, this is a perfect opportunity just for you. So join us March 6th at 5.30 p.m. in our fellowship hall at 3669 Gilderland Ave, right down the road. The Ministry of Giving is a ministry that I hope you get excited about if you participate. There's four ways to give. For those of you people that are in the sanctuary, that are in person, you can give in, on the, in the buckets in the back of the church. If you're online, you can go to BethelFullGospel.com. And if you're on your phone, you can go to the Church Center app or text to give. And for all you old-fashioned folks like myself that like to write a check, just write a check and send it to 3669 Gilderland Ave here in Schenectady. And remember, God loves a cheerful giver. Thank you. What's love got to do, got to do? What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do with it? It's a catchy song. What can we say? It's a catchy song. We're in the third week of our What's Love Got to Do With It series. But before we jump into that this morning, a couple things you just saw in the announcements. Tonight, 6 o'clock, right here, is our Starting Point Connect class. If you're here and you are new to this church and want to find out some more about us and what we believe and what we're doing and get to know some of the pastors, tonight... Six o'clock right here. We would love to have you come out and join us. Also, next Sunday night, we are having a meet and greet dinner. Uh, first one we've had in a while with COVID and winter. Uh, it's, it's been a little bit since we've had one. So next Sunday, 530 at the old building, which is just up the road. This is new, old, whatever, middle person, whatever you are. Uh, great opportunity just to come out, enjoy a good meal, and get to fellowship and meet some of uh, your church family and friends. We'd love to have you come and do it. Uh, what's love got to do with it? A couple weeks ago, we, uh, we started the series. We talked about dating and relationships and purity. Last week, turned our focus to marriage. Uh, last week, I gave you the... 100% guaranteed marriage solution. So if you missed that, you're going to have to go ahead and catch that uh, from last week. This morning, we're going to be talking about raising godly kids. Raising godly children. Talked about loving relationships, loving your spouse. Now we're kind of talking about loving your kids. And before we jump into this this morning, of course, looking at everything that's been going on on the, uh, on the world stage and I was, I was impacted with something. I'm watching the news a little bit. 1991, uh, Ukraine became a nation out from under the Soviet Union. 
30-something years ago. For the last 30 years, there's a whole generation of people who have lived every single day under the threat, under the shadow of a neighboring country wanting to come in and invade them. Uh, a whole generation, and, and this hit me because my girls were born in 98 and 2001. If they were in Ukraine, if we were born there instead of in America, their entire life, they would have spent it under that, that weight. And as we talked this morning about raising godly children, maybe it's just a good time to remind them, maybe even to remind us, be thankful for the country you live in. Be thankful that we're in the freest, most prosperous nation on earth. We've not had a threat like this to our homeland. Long, long, long time. We're blessed. We really are. There's a lot that we want to instill in our children, and this is really the focus of this third and final part of our series. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 has been our verse. It says this, And be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What we've said week after week, whether it was dating, whether it was marriage, and today whether it's children, we don't want to do this the world's way. We want to do it God's way. When it comes to how we live, when it comes to how we love, when it comes to how we raise our children, we don't want to get swept up in the latest fads of this world. We want to do things God's way. Christian parents, today, you want to do things God's way, not the ways of the world. The ways of the world are often in stark contrast to the ways of God. Uh, the way we discipline our children, the way we educate our children. There's, there's many differences between what you would want to teach your kids and what they're learning. Whether it be from the curriculum, whether it be from a faculty member, whether it be from a friend at school, you're just happy they're out of the house for eight hours. But moms and dads, there's a difference between what God wants and often what our world promotes. And I think one area where this is, this is the most obvious uh, and probably the single greatest lie that's been told regarding our children, it's the lie that kids don't need two parents. Uh, they do. They do. Specifically a father. Uh, I know 2022, you could, there, there's broken homes. There's a ton of single parent families. There's parent families with two moms and two dads. Children need a mom and a dad. And more often than not, we see it's the father who's missing. Uh, culture has made a mockery of the role of the father, the patriarchy, the fatherhood represented on TV, cinema. Cinema, who says cinema? How old am I? Good Lord. Jeez, could we edit that? No? Gosh, I'm sorry. The, the role models that we see there are, are laughingstocks, they're jokes, they're men who are, whether it's animated or an actor, the, the, the same thing. The men are clueless, they're out of touch, they're, they're racist, they're, they're homophobic, they're just all these terrible things, and, and that's the role, or they're abusive, and, or they're absent. The ways of our world... In 2015 to 2019, the share of families headed by single parents, listen to these stats, 75% of African-American families, single parent, 59% Hispanic, 38% whites. That's terrible. There's more families in single parent situations than there are in mom and dad, two parents, even if it's not two biological parents. This has been a problem. It's a problem in our world. And dads, I'm talking to you this morning. Need you to hang in there. Need you to hang in there and suck it up and do what's right and get through the hard times. Church, we need a revival of godly men. Godly women, we like you too. We need a revival of godly men. Listen to these stats. I, I found them absolutely mind-boggling. Fatherless homes accounted for 63% of youth suicides. 90% of all homeless and runaway youths come from a fatherless home. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders, wow, 85, come from a fatherless home. 71% of high school dropouts. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions 
come from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent patients currently in substance abuse rehab come from a fatherless home. We look at numbers like this and let's end the narrative that fatherhood doesn't matter and it's not important. But we're not just talking about fatherhood today. We're talking about parenting. And like we've said for the last couple of weeks, God creates, Satan corrupts, and man confuses. And when it comes to parenting, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of confusion. Uh, I know several men and women, some who are here today, who were thrust into single parenting against their will. It was not their plan. You're making the best of your situation. And it will undoubtedly be more difficult for a single parent. But the job's the same. The goal's the same. There's blended families here today. Mom and dad with kids from her marriage, your previous marriage, maybe both. It's different, but the goal's the same. So no matter where you find yourself, if you're on this parenting spectrum, we all have a job to do. And the question is, how do we raise godly children? And the answer is you beat them. No, okay, sorry. So three tips. That's later. It's the advanced class. No, no. Three tips, three things we're going to talk about today. I already ruined it when I said cinema, so I figured we'll just kill the whole, the whole day. Three things to consider, three tips for raising godly children. And I would start with this, and maybe you've heard of this study, or maybe I've shared this with you in the past. They, I want to start by talking about the goal of parenting. And this is a good question. What is the goal of parenting? So they interviewed a large number of American moms. And from those surveyed, the answer given most frequently, the goal for me is that my children would be happy. Happiness is not bad. They asked the same question to a number of Chinese mothers, and the number one answer was different. Chinese mom said, I want my child to be successful. Happy. It's good. If you're here and you don't want your kids to be happy, I got another sermon. Successful. Yeah. And we can get into the definition of success, but I don't think there's a parent here that would argue we would like our kids to be happy and successful. But I want you to know today, that is not the number one goal for a follower of Jesus when it comes to raising our children. The number one goal for a Christian mom and dad would simply be this, we want our child to know Jesus. The most important thing for it, we want our child to have faith. We want our child to be godly. And if you're a follower of Christ, this has to be the most important thing there is. I want to be honest, this is a hard one for me when, when people forget this. or they, Maybe they don't know how to do it, but for some people it, just, it doesn't seem like the most important thing. And, and I, I sit in a spot where I see these things. The most important thing for us, if you're a follower of Jesus, what is more important than your child's eternity? I remember before my kids were born, I thought about this. Before I brought kids into this world, I was thinking and praying, oh God, they need to know you. As they grew up, my number one prayer. But how many of you know it takes more than just a prayer? There's some things that we can do as parents, as mom and dad, that can help make this a reality. Now, last week, I gave you a 100% guarantee to fix your marriage. I don't have a 100% guarantee for you this morning. I wish I did. I wish I could tell you do X, Y, and Z, and you have a 100% chance of your kids serving G. No, I don't. But there's a lot of things we can do. There's a lot of steps we can take. There's a lot of things we can be aware of as godly parents that as we're raising our kids, and maybe some of you are here and, and you don't have kids yet, whatever the case might be, there's things we can do to give them every chance imaginable 
to follow Jesus. But it's got to be the most important thing. There's nothing more important than where your son, your daughter, would spend eternity. More important than school. More important than having good friends. More important than, than sports, and sports get a bad rap. More, more important than being successful or happy or getting to a good college or landing a good job. And I want all of those things for my kids and yours. But none of them are the most important. The most important thing is that our children have faith and is that our children learn to live for the God who loves them and his son who gave his life on a cross for them and they're gonna learn that from us. This needs to be the number one goal. If the number one goal was success, there are things you would do to prepare your child to give them every possible chance to be successful. And I think this will strike, strike a chord with some of you here because you've done this. And this isn't wrong. We want our kids to do well. So maybe when you saw your kids struggling in a class, you got them a tutor. Maybe you paid extra attention to their math homework. Maybe it was an athletic uh, adventure and you made sure they had the best coach, not anti-sports. You made sure they practiced, right? Your, your daughter, the piano player, you had to make sure, practice 45 minutes a day. I think that's what it was when my girls were playing. 45 minutes, you got to practice. Basketball guy, you got to shoot your free throws, 100 free throws every day. Every day you got to shoot 100 so you don't stink and look like Shaq. Yes. Rest, Shaq, rest. So there's steps that you take, there's things that you do, and you can't guarantee it, right? But there's investments that you would make of your time and energy, and there's leading and guiding that you would do as a parent if you want your child to be successful. How should this be any different when it comes to training our children to be godly? See, when it comes to, to being godly, do we put in that kind of effort for our kids? Parents, how about this one? How many times have you asked your kids, did you finish your homework? like a million times, right? And then you next level parents, you check the homework to make sure they didn't just Google the answers because you can just Google it. When, when I was growing up, you could just flip to the back of the book and the answers were there, the good old days. Like, ah, I got this one. <laughs> now you just Google it. But we ask him, right? Hey, did you finish your work? Did you get your schoolwork done? When was the last time you asked your parent, hey, or you asked your child, have you read your Bible today? I, I mean, that seems like if our faith of our children is the most important thing, it seems like a good question. Have you prayed today? What are you learning? What God's teaching you? See, when it comes to other types of success, we just kind of inherently know the things to do to help our kids get ahead. But then when it comes to our faith, we forget to employ the exact same principles. Get them good, good teaching. Follow through with them. Make sure they're being disciplined. Hold them accountable. Everything you would do to teach your daughter piano or shoot a basketball, how much more when we're talking about eternal matters? How much more when we're talking about things of faith? Sports get a bad rap when it comes to church and church kids and sports, and there's always this big, you know, oh, they miss, they miss church for this or that or the other thing. I want you to know today the problem is not sports. I love sports. Sports are great. Sports are fun. Sports teach a lot of valuable lessons. It's good. The problem isn't sports. The problem is priorities. The problem is if Jesus isn't the most important thing and if we as moms and dads aren't teaching them that their faith is the most important thing, we're failing them. We're failing our kids. So we want to, I'm not anti-sports. Gosh, anybody who knows me knows I'm not anti-sports. But we need to make sure that, that our children understand nothing is more important than your walk with Christ. And you know, we get this thinking sometimes, it's either or. Like, oh, well, you can either do that or you can be a good Christian. You can't do both. What are you talking about? There are so many 
men and women out there today who are such great examples of their faith and they're playing sports at the highest level of the pros in college and we hear their testimonies and we're like, oh, that's great. You could be successful and love Jesus. That's okay and I think that's what we want for our kids. We want them to be successful. We want them to be happy but more than anything, we need them to have faith. We need them to have a relationship with Jesus. This is the key. We must remember the goal of parenting. And the goal of parenting for the follower of Jesus simply is this. Make raising your children to be godly the number one priority. Make that the most important thing at all. And remember this. There's a cost to bad priorities. Right? Whether it's in our life or whether we're raising our kids, there, there is a cost associated with, with bad priorities, and we don't want that cost to be eternal. Let's make sure we are teaching our children the priority of Jesus, the priority of their faith. So parents must remember the number one goal, teaching your children to be godly. Number two, Discipline. Now we'll beat them. Can't even joke about that anymore because that's happened. Too many kids have suffered. T too many adults remember your childhood growing up. That never works. And we need to separate beating and abuse from discipline, because what inevitably happens is if you were exposed to some of the, the, the bad side of that, you err the other way. So we need to separate that, and we need to talk about discipline as the Word of God talks about discipline. I'm a fan of strategic spanking. Rare, well-timed, well-placed, as needed. Uh, didn't, I had girls, I didn't have to I'd have to spank much. I'd probably count on one hand. <laughs> talk, to a, talk to a dad after service. He's like, girls, right? Yeah. Boys are different. You have to spank a boy every morning because they're doing stuff you don't even know. <laughs> they, they just got away with it. So probably from like age three to 40, you should probably. <laughs> What's the purpose of discipline? The purpose of discipline is to correct inappropriate behavior Discipline should not be the byproduct of your anger with what's happened. There's a really big difference there. And it could look the same, but if you're disciplining because you're angry, they see that. The point, the goal of discipline is to correct behavior. We're not punishing our kids because of how we feel, but trying to correct what they've done. What you did made me angry, so I'm disciplining you. No. What you did embarrassed me, so I'm... No, it's not about you. It's about correcting bad behavior. Let me give you a, a, a golden tip that I wish I had... I wish I had figured it out probably 49 years earlier than I did. James chapter 1, verse 20, simply says this. And I've read the verse a billion times and never really thought about it in the context of parenting. The wrath of man or woman does not produce the righteousness of God. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Because if getting angry at your kids made them holy, I would have won. Because <laughs> I get angry all day. That's easy. But... That's not what does it. There's some other things that we need to do, not just be angry, not just yell at your kids, certainly not, uh, not crossing over that line of, of what discipline is. And let me share this with you too, and this is just a little added, added bonus. If you're in a blended family, I, I'm not, I wasn't raised in a blended family, but what I'm, I'm talking about from a blended family is you, you're with your spouse's children from a previous marriage or they're with yours or whatever. Um, when it comes to disciplining and parenting, this, this issue is one of the most difficult to navigate. 
So let me just throw this to you and kind of tuck it in your pocket and remember this. When it, when it, and this is true for all parents and everything, but even more so when it comes to disciplining your kids in a blended family situation, you and your spouse have to, you need to be on the same page. A- and that's true with biological mom and dad too. You absolutely need to be on the same page because it it gets very difficult when you're trying to discipline her children or she's trying. You have to be together on that. And, And that's not impossible to do because that's how it should be in every marriage, but even more so when it comes to a blended family. Let's take a minute and let's look at what God's word tells us about the nature and the importance of discipline. And we find it in Hebrews chapter 12. And in Hebrews chapter 12, the Lord's talking, uh, Paul's talking about the Lord's discipline, uh, the author of Hebrews, who I think is Paul, um, talking about the Lord's discipline. And it says that the Lord disciplines those he loves. It talks about discipline as an essential part of what it means to be a child. So for a parent to discipline is natural and ordinary. But I really want to look at verse 11 because it kind of lays out discipline for us. It says, no discipline, and young people, you can say amen, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Amen. <laughs> yes, that, that's how it works. That's why it's called discipline. It's not fun. It does not seem pleasant, but painful. Later on, however, And here's something we're going to come back to a few times this morning. Later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Mom and dad, you are playing the long game. You have to remember this. Because the short game, you might want to kill them. And I say that jokingly. The short game, you're like, oh, I'm done. Can't you just graduate? Can't you get married and move out of the house? (laughs) The short game, every parent has days like that. We're playing the long game. And that's really what discipline teaches us. Discipline doesn't always correct things tomorrow. Pastor, what if I spanked harder? No, no, that's not how it works. We want to be consistent, but mom and dad, remember this. You're investing. You're investing when they're three, four, five, six, when they're, when they're preteens, when they're teenagers. Nobody likes teenagers. My girls are older. I'm allowed to say that now. And you can't, you can't laugh because your teenager's next to you, so watch it. But I know. It's hard, but we're in this for the long haul. It's not just to make tomorrow better. It's that down the road we have children who love God, who are, who are well-adjusted, Adults who love Jesus. Parents, you need, to, you need to keep this strategy in mind. Even when you feel like you lost the battle today, we are in this for the long haul. We are raising up the next generation with, with God's help. So hang in there. Keep going. Play, play the long game. No discipline seems pleasant but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We learn from this verse that one, discipline is essential. It is a normal part of life and raising children. In fact, Scripture goes so far to say if you're not disciplined, you're not a legitimate child. It says that God disciplines those that he loves. That's us. So we have the example. Discipline needs to happen. Also, it says that discipline's not pleasant. I hear some of you parents, you send your kids to your room. Go to your room. Their room has an iPhone, an iPad, a laptop, a TV, Hulu, Netflix. I want to go to their room. That sounds like a wonderful place. No discipline is pleasant. That's why it's discipline. That's why... Needs to count. And then we remember, it produces the harvest later. It produces the harvest later. I've said this in the past, and I think it's so powerful. Mom, dad, anything you're not correcting, you're approving. 
if you don't correct it, you approve it. If your son comes home and you told him, be in the house by 11, he rolls in at 12. If you don't correct it, next time it's 12, 12 30, maybe one. If you let your son, daughter talk back to their mother and you don't address it, next time he's talking back worse, or maybe to you. Whatever you don't correct, you approve. Speaking of talking back to your mother, it may come as a shock to some of you that as a child, I had a rather sharp tongue. Whoa, that's not the funny part. Relax. And I remember one night, specifically, we were having dinner, and I'm a very finicky eater. I was even worse as a kid. And I was sitting between my mom and my dad, my brothers across from me, my sisters on my left, down at the end. And I... Don't even remember what I said, but I said something about my mom or her cooking, just a little sarcasm, just a little, because I think I'm so funny. And there was a surgical strike conducted on my face. (laughs) And it was quick, and it was sudden, and it, you know, it, oh, why, oh, whoo, did not see that. That was stealthy. That was Navy SEAL stuff, like, didn't see it coming. And, you know, yeah, okay, sorry. And I kind of pulled it together. And I remember later that night I was playing with my brother. And I I made the comment to him, I can't believe mom slapped me like that. And he looked at me and he goes, dude, that was dad. (laughs) (laughs) Mom and dad, you need to be on the same page, right? Uh, We need to be on the same page. And if we don't correct it, we approve it. Too often... Parents choose peace over discipline. That is a false peace. It's a false peace. Peace is not the absence of war. Because war can be boiling right beneath the surface. That's a false peace. When you avoid difficult situations. And we can we can err on two extremes. We've talked a little bit about you know, the the physical abuse side of it, you could err on the other extreme and not address anything or leave it all to the other parent. Those were the most feared words in my household growing up. When, When my brother and I pushed my mom too far, the most feared words were, wait till your father gets home. Four o'clock, we hear the garage door, we'd be running for our rooms. <laughs> Terror. We, we have a job to do when it comes to raising our children. And don't, don't settle for, for fake peace over discipline. Kids need parents to act like parents. Not besties. Not your best friend. You need to instruct, to lead, to guide, to discipline, to train. Proverbs 22.6. We see the long game. At play again here. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We like the first part of the verse. We love the last part of the verse. We forget the middle. Train up a child in the way he should go. Amen. And he won't depart from it. Hallelujah. When he's older. This verse is not a guarantee that your child will never wander. It's a promise that when you raise him in the ways of the Lord, he'll be able to find his way back. It's the long game. It, it's investing every single day in good times and bad times and hard times and easy times, knowing that the word of God that you're sowing into their life will not return empty. It will not return void. So we have the goal of parenting. We have discipline. I'll share this third one with you, and I think this is really where where the rubber meets the road, and this is where all of us together have a responsibility, whether you are a mom or a dad, whether you're a single parent, whether you're in a blended family, step parent, whatever situation you find yourself in. And even for you grandparents, even for those of you who don't have kids yet, maybe you will someday, or maybe you're not going to have kids, but there's other people watching you. This third one really just hits all of us the most important thing we can do for our kids is to set a godly example. This is less about what they do and a whole lot more 
about what we do. Because the faith that you have and the life that you live should draw your children to Jesus. And it certainly shouldn't push them away. So the power of a godly example becomes absolutely critical. Moms, dads, this is a tough one. Because kids, they see everything. They hear what we say, but they see what we do. They see how we handle situations. Kids at a very young age can figure out if Sunday mornings from 10.30 to 12 are an outlier because the rest of the week, mom and dad are different. The power of a godly example. This really hinges on us. Parents, if we want to raise godly kids, we need to live godly lives. And if we want to see their faith be the most important thing to them, they need to see it as the most important thing to you. I've shared the quote before, if going to church is optional for you, it will be non-existent to your children. Make their faith in God your top priority as a parent. Set the example. 1 Timothy 4.12 Paul is encouraging Timothy, who's pastoring a church. He's a little bit younger. And, and the way he encourages him, I think it, it really speaks a lot for how parents need to, need to approach their children. Listen to what he says. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. So if you're a young parent, you can just eat that up. But if you're old, skip that part. But set an example. The verse says, set an example for the believers. Set an example for your children. Set the example in your speech, your conduct, your love, in faith, and in purity. How you talk, how you live, how you treat people, your faith, your purity, your conduct, your behavior. Set an example. Mom, dad, we need to set an example. Set an example with your words. Make sure your words are encouraging. Make sure your words are building your children up, not tearing your children down. Be an example how you love. I've heard it said that the best thing you can do for your kids is to love your husband, love your wife. Best thing you can do to be a good parent is to work on having a good marriage. And let them see, let them see the good marriage. Let them see you treating your spouse with love, with respect. Set an example in your faith. In your faith. Get caught serving God. Kids are going to catch us doing all kinds of stuff, right? We're not per Kids, let me give you the... the little behind-the-scenes thing. We are making this up as we go. We're doing our best. Give us some grace. You are unique. There is no book on how to raise you. You're totally different from your siblings. It's weird. We're trying. <laughs> and every parent said, amen. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not easy. It's not piece of cake. We do the best that we can for our kids to love them, to show them God's way. But in all of that, we want to set the example. Get caught serving God. Get caught reading your Bible. Get caught praying for your kids. There's enough times, just the nature of parenthood, they're going to catch you doing stuff you wish they didn't catch. And we try to shield them from it, but sometimes we, we all make mistakes. Doesn't matter, married, single, blended, whatever the situation but let them catch you being godly. Let them catch you treating people with the love of Jesus. Let them catch you growing in your faith. They hear what we say, but boy, they watch what we do. We must set a godly example for our children. And I think that godly example that we set is probably the most powerful thing that we can give our kids. I'll ask the worship team, to join us as we close this morning. And you know, as we wrap up both today and, and even wrapping up this series, when it comes to our kids, we understand that God's working through uh, a set of imperfect parents 
to raise a godly generation of children. And parents, I think more than ever, we need God's help. We need his help every day. We need his help in so many areas, but we really need his help when it comes to raising our kids. And there's some of you who are sitting here today and you're like, Pastor, great word. I needed that 40 years ago. Thanks for nothing. (laughs) It's hard. It's tough. It's a lot lot of mistakes, a lot of ups and downs. Remember, Mom, Dad, you're in this for the long haul. You'll never stop being Mom and Dad. It doesn't matter how old your kids get. Remember, you're setting the example. How you live matters. It's important. How you demonstrate your faith for them, it's important. They need to see it. And what I really want you to take away as well today, we've all messed up. There's no perfect parents. There's no perfect kids. Just Jesus. There's grace. You've had rough patches. There's grace. You have seasons in your life where you were not the dad you were supposed to be. There's grace. You've had seasons as a mom where you've lost it a little bit. Listen, there's grace. We've all messed this up plenty. There is enough culpability to go around. But we remember that our loving Heavenly Father who loves us and disciplines us, showers us with His grace. We are imperfect people just doing the best that we can to raise the next generation to love Jesus and to serve him. Kids, you need to have grace for your parents. And I might be talking to a 40-year-old kid this morning. And mom, dad, you need to have grace for yourself. And there's this verse in Ephesians, and I share it often because it applies to everything. It says that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So I want you to know this morning, mom, dad, no matter what's transpired in the past, no matter what situation or circumstance you find yourself in, God will give you everything that you need to get through this, to do it well, to put your best foot forward. There's no guarantees, no guarantees with this one. But let's do everything in our power to lead our children to a lifelong path of faith. And after we've done everything that we can do, you know what's left? We pray. We just pray. We live, we set the example every day, and we pray for our kids. Mom and dad, that's another, another one of those most important things you can do. Just begin to pray for your child. And I want you to remember this, and that this is hard for us to wrap our minds around. God loves your children even more than you do. That's that's hard to imagine. When we pray to our Heavenly Father about our kids, He loves them even more than we do. He certainly wants what's best and knows what's best. Parents, we got a tough job, but I'm thankful that we don't have to do it alone. We have God, we have his grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to just fill in all the gaps, all all the blanks. And together, as a church family, as a family of faith, let's commit ourselves to raising the next generation in the Lord. Can't go back and undo the past, but we we can change things going forward. Let's commit ourselves to this next generation. Let's set the best example we can as mom and dad. Let's keep the goal clear. The most important thing, raising a godly child. Would you stand together with me? As we close the service this morning, let me just have a word of prayer over you. Then the team will come and they'll play a final song. Thank you, Jesus. Mom, dad, if you're here today and you just need some some power, some grace from God, just a touch from his Holy Spirit. I just want to invite you right where you are. Just put your hands up. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we need you. Lord, I thank you for grace because we get this wrong a lot. 
thank you for your grace. Thank you for your patience, Lord. Thank you that you cover our, our mistakes. Lord, I pray for our children. I pray for this next generation. Next generation of young men and young women to be raised in the faith. And Lord, you've entrusted us with their care. God, I pray for moms and dads today that they would step into their God-given role. Lord, that they would realize the importance every day of what they're doing. Lord, that we would keep our eyes on you. You are the goal, you're the purpose, the reason. And Lord, that we would have patience. Lord, that we would be stable, consistent. Lord, that we would hold our tongue when we need to. And Father, also that we'd not be afraid to speak. Lord, help us. Help us to be everything you've called us to be. And thank you for your grace. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit to help us do what we need to do. Lord, I pray for the families here today. I pray for the parents, the children. God, just a special blessing on them. Lord, help us to raise our children to have faith. We thank you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. If you'd like to pray, the altar is open. Let's spend a few moments in his presence.
forward, Lord. And as we go forward this week, I pray that you would help us to mold the next generation to follow you. Whether it be our own family or setting that example, God, we want to show more of you to make this world a better place that our children would seek after you with their, all of their hearts, Father. We thank you and we praise you. Have your way in our kids, in your name. Amen. Have a blessed week, church.